people here for this very important discussion on George Washington and religious freedom. The 92nd Street Y in New York for more than 146 years has been a forum for civic and civil dialogue, and tonight's program continues this commitment. Also, as part of our Civic Life, Life series coming up, we have on May 8th, uh, Valerie Biden Owens with John Meacham, and then on May 4th, uh, Maggie Haberman and Alex Burns, and Al Franken will return to the 92nd Street Y with um, Jeff Greenfield on May 31st. These are just a few of the many ongoing live in-person programs that we have and you are welcome to tune in live stream to any you are unable to come to in person. And of course, I want to welcome our live stream audience tuning in this evening. I invite you to visit 92y.org for more information on all our events. We are thrilled tonight to be the host of the world premiere of the short film entitled George Washington and the Pursuit of Religious Freedom, followed by a panel discussion with the distinguished historians, Mount Vernon's Doug Bradburn and Yale University's Joanne Friedman, moderated by our very good friend, David Rubenstein. As a community center, we encourage your participation in tonight's dialogue. Please write your questions on the cards you've received for those of you who are tuning in, who are with us on 92nd Street. And for those of you who are watching online, please write your questions in the chat box and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, we will have a brief three minute changeover uh, after the film screening, so just be patient um, and we will be back with the panel uh, in a few minutes after that screen change. I want to take this moment to thank the Mount Vernon's Ladies Association for their wonderful collaboration and support. It really is a wonderful thing when we find like-minded partners. And I also want to thank David Rubenstein for the great idea to bring this program to life on our stage. Now to frame our discussion, I'm delighted to introduce Doug Bradburn. Doug is the president and CEO of George Washington's Mount Vernon and the former founding director of the Fred W. Smith National Library for the study of George Washington at Mount Vernon. And he is an award-winning author and well-known scholar of early American history. Before coming to Mount Vernon, he served as the chair of the history department at Binghamton University. He received his PhD in history from the University of Chicago and has a BA in history and economics from the University of Virginia. Please welcome Doug Bradburn. Thank you, Susan, so much. I'm delighted and honored to be here uh, in this incredibly esteemed place uh, and tell you a little bit about uh, the program you're about to see this evening. Uh, the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, of course, saved George Washington's home over 160 years ago. And it's been uh, preserved and open for uh, tourism since then. And that institution, of which I'm honored to be the leader, uh, has been a leader in preservation and education for, for a long time. And I think the mission is as important as ever. It is to preserve that place, to make sure that George Washington's home is available for people to understand and draw from. But it was preserved because there was a very strong belief that this country, which is an experiment in democracy, requires an educated citizenry, and educated about why we are a self-governing nation, uh, and that, uh, to learn that story, it's very helpful to go to those places uh, where the founders lived and worked. And I think today we are in a bit of a crisis of confidence in this nation. If you look at polls and in institutions of government in Congress, in the presidency, in the justice system, in the media, in academia, they're polling at all-time lows in terms of uh, Americans' faith and trust 
in these institutions, but it can't be separated from uh, an all-time low in civic understanding and history understanding as well. Uh, in 2011, the Annenberg Public Policy uh, Center did a poll of all voting age Americans and only 37% of voting age Americans could name the three branches of government. And they redid the poll in 2017 and the number was down to 29%. Now, we know uh, that in a country that governs itself, you need to have an educated citizenry. And of course, our first president, George Washington, in his inaugural address and his farewell address, emphasized that very point. Uh, in his inaugural address, he said, knowledge is in every country the surest basis of public happiness. In his farewell address, he said, in proportion as the structure of a government gives force to public opinion, it is essential that public opinion should be enlightened. With this deduction in the science of government, the citizenry will know their duties and their rights. And they'll understand their place in this grand experiment, what he called the great experiment in human happiness, of which we're all part of that incredible continuity and have a responsibility to, to transfer on to the rising generation of citizens, our future rulers, those children in schools. And that frames the, the movie you're going to see tonight, the short film, is one of uh, four now that the Mount Vernon Ladies Association has produced. Uh, we are producing content for teachers and students across the country. We help educate teachers every year. We have a broad network of teachers because it's very challenging to teach uh, the difficult history of this country uh, in all of its uh, glories and all of its challenges. Uh, and this is a tool you'll see tonight is a very powerful tool that will be used in classrooms. I'm happy to say the three previous movies that we've made, the films, are used widely. They've had many millions of views at this point. In fact, Mount Vernon's videos in the last year has had over 60 million views on YouTube. Now, that's not as many views as you might get from the Kardashians or someone else, but that's part of the problem, isn't it, right there? Uh, we need to get these resources out there, and we need to make them exciting for a rising generation of students. Uh, this film, uh, I think you'll agree, is going to explore a very important topic that helps us understand values that Americans share that come through the very stories of our nation's founding, in this case, the value of the idea of freedom of conscience uh, in this country. Now, I was uh, very upset to read in the New York Times on my way up here on uh, Wednesday uh, an article in the New York Times saying that there have been more anti-Semitic attacks in New York State this year than at any time since they've been recorded, since 1979, since the Anti-Defamation League has been recording these texts. So we're seeing a rise in this sort of uh, hatred uh, and uh, incivility, which again is a critical challenge for all of us who want our democracy to succeed, and to do that we need to educate and teach. And so I think uh, as much as ever, uh, the subject of this evening's conversation and movie, I hope, will, uh, will be a spur to us to not only tell others about it, encourage people to learn about it, uh, and we all have that responsibility as adults as well uh, to pass on these stories. I'm happy to say that this uh, film was made possible by generous funding of Irv and Nancy Chase. I thank them very much for that. I thank our partners with Wide Awake Films who are here with us tonight, Sean Seeley, Julia Barnett, I'm also happy to say that some of the letters associated with George Washington's visit to the Toro Synagogue in Newport are available for viewing here tonight for people who are here, thanks to Seth Caller, uh, who, who made them available for us this evening. And of course, I want to thank uh, David and Joanne for being a part of the conversation uh, tonight, as well as the Toro Synagogue in Newport and the Newport Historical Society who helped make this film possible. So with that, without any further ado, uh, let's enjoy the world premiere of George Washington in the Pursuit of Religious Freedom. Thank you. That's correct. It is March 1754. A young lieutenant colonel is brought before his superiors and presented with a document. I do declare that there is no transubstantiation in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. It is a vow rejecting the doctrines of the Catholic Church. Or in the elements of bread and wine at or after the consecration. With war raging between Protestant England and Catholic France, 
It is required that all officers of the British Empire sign it or lose their commission. There are by any person whatsoever. He is a patriotic subject, both loyal and ambitious, and signs with little hesitation. Lieutenant Colonel George Washington would then depart with his regiment to fight for the British Empire. It's all in order, sir. But in time, he would come to be Britain's great adversary and the great champion of religious freedom. Religious faith provides personal connection to morals that shape beliefs and societies. But for most of human history, there was no separation between church and state. Most governments required everyone to follow a single religion, and those who did not were persecuted. Religious wars plagued much of the world for centuries. Protestants were excommunicated by ruling Catholics. Catholics were martyred where Protestants ruled. Jews were demonized, expelled, and dispersed. For many of these unfortunates, North America was a chance to begin again. When the English established their first colony in Virginia in 1607, they brought the Church of England with them. In 1620, a group of pilgrims arrived at Plymouth. Maryland was founded by Roman Catholics. America's first Jews settled in what became New York City. Quakers chartered Pennsylvania. Enslaved Africans carried with them a variety of religious traditions. Across two centuries, North America became a patchwork for many existing faiths and religious practices and sparked the creation of new ones. In this society. We have passed laws in this colony. Your teachings pollute our values. Many who sought religious freedom in the colonies did not tolerate religious difference. They saw the New World as a place to perfect their own form of worship and often persecuted those who practiced differently. New Englanders based laws on the Bible. Catholics barred Protestants from holding office until the Protestants gained power and barred the Catholics. Jews were forbidden from holding office everywhere. Native American religious practices were brutally suppressed. In this world, nearly every aspect of life could be regulated by the church. In George Washington's Virginia, the Anglican Church was the established state religion. Raised in a deeply religious home, he was a devout Anglican and served as a parish leader. All inhabitants were required to pay taxes to support Anglican ministers, including the growing numbers of dissenters, including Presbyterians and Baptists. People could be fined if they did not attend services. The only legal marriages were those performed by a minister of the Church of England. As a member of the colonial vestry, George Washington helped enforce these rules. If you were in the religious minority, often your only liberty was the freedom to go elsewhere. And many did. The colonies and their diversity of faiths would prove increasingly difficult to control by the distant British Empire and the Church of England. In 1776, men who worshipped differently came together and declared that, under the laws of nature and of nature's God, the 13 colonies were independent. But claims of liberty would not come without a fight. The Continental Congress needed as much support as they could muster. People of all faiths would ultimately join the cause. When Washington takes command of the Continental Army, he's given the task to make real the bold claims of the Declaration of Independence. But it was a daunting challenge. 
The army was a motley collection of strangers from different cultures and regions and different religious expectations. It was a complex issue of leadership. How do you discipline and organize an army when they have a diversity of religious practices? How do you encourage moral behavior while not requiring a uniformity of belief? On the one hand, his approach was traditional. Washington ensured that there were chaplains available and required soldiers attended services when they could. But he also innovated. He embraced the religious diversity of the army. He made a point of worshiping with different denominations. On religious holidays, Washington sought amity. He emphasized the similarities across the diverse religions of his soldiers. And he regularly ordered the army to give thanks to a benign providence. The war proved to Washington that people of different beliefs can achieve together in pursuit of a common cause. Men so different from him had fought with valor and served with loyalty. He saw their goodness and dedication, and he needed them. The victory at Yorktown in 1781 affirmed the success of Washington's leadership. The achievement of American independence proved the truth of the Declaration and opened up possibilities to reimagine a new republic. Uncertainty remained around the relationship between religion and government in the newly independent states. Inspired by the Enlightenment idea that all people have the right to worship according to the dictates of conscience, as well as the acknowledgement that independence could not have been won without the support of people of many faiths. The Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, written by Thomas Jefferson, severed all connections between church and state. But these rights were not guaranteed in all states. 1787 saw the creation of the Constitution and a new federal government. But how would this new government affect the diverse religious practices across the 13 states? Would all Americans be able to worship as they please? Elected unanimously as the first president of the United States, President Washington could not imagine a nation without religion, believing it was fundamental to a moral republic. But he would not require a particular type of religious practice, believing it was a violation of individual rights. Washington noted, We should never again see religious disputes carried to such a pitch as to endanger the peace of society. That would be the challenge. Could there be national unity without religious uniformity? As the new president, Washington made it a priority to visit communities across the United States to understand the concerns of the American people. At each stop, he received petitions from political leaders, business groups, religious communities, fraternal organizations, and others. Each congratulated Washington on his election and made requests of the new government. Few were as concerned about religious freedom as America's Jewish citizens. The first Jews had sought refuge throughout the Americas after years of exile. By 1790, there had been Jewish communities in North America for over a century, despite anti-Semitism and efforts at expulsion. Still, they remained a vulnerable minority. By the time of Washington's inauguration, they numbered a few thousand in a nation of more than three million Christians. On August 17th, Washington arrived in Newport, Rhode Island. He was greeted by the firing of cannon, the ringing bells, and the enthusiasm of scores of locals. Among them, Moses Satius, a representative of the Turo Synagogue. On behalf of his congregation, he delivered a petition which expressed their hope that Jewish people could safely practice their religion and would be treated as full citizens. 
Washington replied with a letter to the congregants of the Turo Synagogue. He hoped that Jewish citizens would find goodwill and safety in the United States. Washington expressed aspiration that the federal government be based on freedom of conscience, not simply religious tolerance. He proclaimed that it is now no more that toleration is spoken of, as if it was by the indulgence of one class of people that another enjoyed the exercise of their inherent natural rights. This was a revolutionary statement. Washington's letter concluded powerfully by agreeing with Moses Satius's words that the United States gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance. Mr. Mason, do you believe we could see six to eight copies of this by the day after tomorrow for our charter members to look over as well? Such a clear statement of the values of the new nation before the passage of the First Amendment to the Constitution played a critical role in solidifying the trends towards religious freedom. In the first two years of his presidency, Washington responded to at least 18 religious communities in a similar manner, assuring each that they were safe and free to practice their religion. His words were printed in newspapers throughout the country and even echoed across the Atlantic. Thomas Paine, who was in Paris in support of the French Revolution, quoted at length from a newspaper copy of Washington's letter to the Society of Quakers that the law should reflect freedom of conscience. Washington's assurances were affirmed with the 1791 ratification of the First Amendment to the Constitution, which guaranteed to all citizens that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Religious freedom was now enshrined in the fundamental law of the United States. And all the other freedoms of the First Amendment, of speech, of the press, of petition and assembly, stem from the notion that the state does not have a monopoly on the truth and that the government should not control the rights of individuals to follow their conscience. Since Washington, American presidents have maintained the tradition of extending goodwill to faiths around the world. We are still striving to achieve a more perfect union. Hatred and violence still exist, but Washington's words live on inspiring those who would listen. The founding of the United States was revolutionary in many ways. Today the establishment of religious freedom remains relevant. It is a value that all Americans should share and it ought to be emulated around the world. When George Washington said farewell to the nation, he reminded the people that there would always be a place for religion in American life but that people should never live in fear of being prevented from practicing their religion. In concluding his letter to the people of the Turo Synagogue, Washington expressed the hope that the Father of all mercies scatter light and not darkness upon our paths and make us all in our several vocations useful here and in His own due time and way everlastingly happy.
You ready? Okay. So, uh, welcome everyone to the second part of our program, and we have uh, Professor Freeman and uh, Doug Bradburn, also previously a professor as well. Okay. You can call me doctor. So let me start off, uh, Doug. Uh, how many people pre-COVID actually visit Mount Vernon, yeah. just to put the setting right? Yeah, thank you. So Mount Vernon gets a million visitors a year still. And uh, of those, about 350,000 are school kids on that annual trip to Washington, D.C. Okay. Now, uh, how did the Mount Vernon Ladies Association come to actually buy this? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, so when George Washington died in 1799, Martha died in 1801, they had no heirs of their body, but he did have a, a nephew that inherited Mount Vernon, Bushrod Washington, who was a Supreme Court justice. And then it went to other members of the Washington family. By the 1850s, falling into disrepair, uh, you know, it's a wooden structure in the middle of the Virginia summers and all the outbuildings, and it had already become a pilgrimage site for Americans and others because George Washington is buried there. And the family tried to sell it to the state of Virginia, and they tried to sell it to the U.S. Congress, but there, this is before the national park system or anything like that. And the Congress couldn't, they couldn't figure it out, and the Virginia uh, couldn't figure it out. And so this group of women came together and said, well, if the men of America won't save the father of their country's house, then the women shall, and they did. <laughs> and so that's the, the board is but, all um, women, the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. Okay, so they've owned it ever since? Yes, since 1860 when it's been open to visitors. And how can they do all this without having men involved? How does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, they do it very well uh, without having men involved okay. at all. And now, uh, you know, I think David McCullough, when we, kicked, when we opened the library, it was at a time when the, when, when the government was shut down again, the U.S. Right. government. And he famously said, we should have the ladies run it, you know, and that's, they're probably, he's probably right. So is there any uh, government money coming into Mount Vernon? No. So Mount Vernon is fully funded by uh, our business operations, ticket sales, retail sales, food sales, and then generous uh, philanthropy and donor-supported funds. We don't and haven't received government funds. Uh, the Ladies Association like to remain independent. And you said it was a wood structure, but it looks like it's brick or kind yeah. of uh, cement or something. Yeah. Wh wh why do they... Why do you say it's... Yeah, George Washington wanted it to look like stone, you know. He wanted it to look like a grand classical edifice, but there wasn't any available stone in the region in that period that he could afford, and so uh, he did a process called rustication. So the, the mansion is covered in pine boards that are cut to look like stone blocks, and then they cover the, the boards with uh, paint and sand, in fact, which has been... It, it's been an amazing way to keep it together. We, we just restored the... The mansion, we're in the process of res restoring all the exterior of the mansion. We strip it all down to the original boards, and over 83% of the boards are from the 18th century. So it's oh. the best preserved 18th century house in America. And uh, today, uh, you support yourself with just tourists coming and other things, is that right? That's right. So to the, the tourists who come and the food and the retail okay. cover about 70% of our budget, and the rest is donor supported funds a generous philanthropy as well as our endowment. So a couple questions about George Washington before we get to Professor Friedman. Um, did George Washington really cut a cherry tree down <laughs> and, or not? It depends on who you believe. Yeah, uh, not clear, maybe not, but it's a good story if he did. He cut it down and he wouldn't tell a lie. Well, you wouldn't tell us a lie, right? About yeah. How you, so, he, so he didn't. He didn't. All right, yeah. so what about, did he throw a dollar across the Potomac? Never threw a dollar across the Potomac, perhaps the Rappahannock River, which where he grew up at Ferry Farm, which is right across from Fredericksburg. A good high school baseball player could throw a rock across right. the river there. And did he have wooden teeth? He did not have wooden teeth. Uh, his dentures were made out of lots of different human teeth, as well as whale bones cut down. But they were made by a New Yorker, uh, Dr. Uh, Greenwood. And that's where the, the misnomer of wooden teeth came from, that these were okay. Greenwood's teeth or Wood's teeth, and, and, uh, and there you okay. go. Okay. Yeah. So, Joanne, let me ask you, if Washington had not been the uh, general that won the Revolutionary War, would he have been considered a great president? In other words, as a president, was he really that good, or was he just famous because he was a good general? No, I think he was a, a great president. And I say that in part not necessarily because he did great acts, but because as the first president, every single thing that he did was precedent setting, everything. And he knew that, he understood that, he was careful about that. 
And he, it, you know, it's fascinating when you read his correspondence. He's thinking about things like the table settings for the president's mansion, mm -hmm. and he's consistent in basically saying he wants a middle style, mm -hmm. right? He doesn't want it to be too fancy and monarchical. Right. He doesn't want it to be too plain because he needs to be mm -hmm. holding up the dignity of the nation. Mm -hmm. So his decisions, the way that he led the country, in addition to the fact that I think just generally he thought about the impact of all he did, I think that made him a great president. What, uh, in, in the case of uh, George Washington, was he um, a person that uh, his colleagues really respected him, or they just had to look up to him because he had won the war, but what did they really think about him behind his back? <laughs> Ooh, the gossip about George yeah. Washington. <laughs> um, no, I mean, people, I think, pretty much respected him. They were a little intimidated by him. Okay. Um, I think partly reputation and partly because he was a tall person. Um, and people would comment all the time. He was kind of a, a presence in the room. Um, I don't, you know, there were, the, as far as gossip about Washington, sometimes people like to claim that Hamilton was the guy doing all the work behind the scenes when he was president. You know, that he was, I think the, someone says he's the, like the washcloth or dishcloth. Uh, well, well, you're an expert on Hamilton. I wanted to ask you about that in a moment. But yeah. the George Washington did not have a college education. Unlike many of the founding fathers, he didn't have a, uh, really much education, but his letters seem to be pretty literate, from my standards at least. How did he write those, or did somebody else write them for him? Mm. Well, they, pretty much they're his. You know, there were people writing for him when he was a general during the Revolution, so there were his aides, and he could say something to someone like Hamilton, I want this to do this there and go say it for me. But there's a very Washingtonian style of writing. It, it's very long sentences with lots of phrases, like the, it, you, they, they trail. So you can tell when you read a sentence, has that Washington flair. So has Washington been diminished a bit like Jefferson and other early presidents because they were slave owners in recent times? Because when I went to school, it wasn't emphasized that George Washington was a slave owner. Uh, how many slaves did he own? And was he a, a person who beat his slaves? And did he care about his slaves very much? And in the end, did he free his slaves? Well, I can talk to you a little bit about the founders of slavery. I'm going to turn to you for okay. the details on, on numbers and what was happening yeah, at the please. plantation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, generally speaking, in some ways, the way the nation is grappling with the people who we lump as the founders, and particularly the southern ones who had plantations and were slave owners, we tend to, and, and even the phrase the founders does this, yeah. it's as though there's this big cluster of people that are sort of floating above the nation and represent ideals. And the fact of the matter is, and it, this doesn't sound shocking to say, but I think people don't think it, right? They didn't live up to those ideals. The ideals matter tremendously, but it also matters that they didn't live up to them. Mm. And that struggle, and sometimes it wasn't even a struggle. Sometimes they were mouthing what they wanted things to be like and then not living up to them. That gap, is who we are, right? When you look back to this time period and look at the founders, you can't understand where we are without acknowledging what the ideals that were admirable and all the ways in which we didn't meet those ideals. That's, that's the ongoing national struggle. Mm. Well, Thomas Jefferson had some letters where he said maybe slavery wasn't so wonderful. And then early on in his political career, he kind of said maybe we should free the slaves, have them move somewhere else. Did there any evidence that George Washington ever wanted to get rid of slavery? I'm going to turn to you. Yeah, look, um, I, it's a great question. And I do think, you know, some of the bloom is off the rose of Washington and the, found, the founders generally, um, because we, we want them to live up to these ideals. But I mean, I think if we take a step back and recognize that George Washington, when he was born and when he inherited the first enslaved people when his father died, when he's 11 years old, Slavery was legal and practiced everywhere in the Atlantic world and had been for a very, very long time and since the ancient world in different forms and different kinds. At the time of his death, slavery had been ended in the northern colonies in part because of the American Revolution, because of the liberation that he helped create. Now, his own personal journey around slavery is really fascinating because he grows up in a world where it isn't questioned, certainly by the owners of the enslaved people, um, but yet through his experience of the war where he has to, where he actually, the army he takes to Yorktown is one fifth African American. Uh, you know, he commands the first integrated army in America until Truman. Uh, and then of course he does express, David, to your question, the first time we see him expressing 
his idea that he wants to get quit of slavery, it's in this period through the American War and into the 1780s. There's some Quakers who visit him in Virginia who were anti-slavery, and they leave Mount Vernon believing that Washington is on their side, that he's you know, going to free his slaves. In the 1790s, Washington creates a map of Mount Vernon and wants to hire English uh, renters to take over the outlying parts of Mount Vernon and transition his enslaved people to free tenant paying. And then ultimately in his will, he does free uh, the slaves that he owns directly, uh, and not only frees them, but he allows for the, the education of all the people who are under the age of 21, and he allows pensions for all the people that are too old to work. And these pensions are paid out until the 1840s. Right. So he doesn't do as much as we would like from the vantage of the 21st century, but it's a remarkable transformation of a man who grew up in a world where there was no assumption of equality. Uh, he freed those slaves upon the death of his wife. That's right, yeah. So. You think Martha Washington was happy sitting around there knowing the slaves know as soon as she dies they're going to be free? What happened? Yeah, well, she freed them earlier than she died because right. her, her nephew who was inheriting Mount Vernon Bushrod. The Supreme Court Justice encouraged her to do that. And, and she admitted to Al, uh, Abigail Adams, actually, that uh, she was worried that right. uh, okay. she might uh, uh, be uh, a victim of poisoning. Right. Or so, Joanne, uh, let me ask you. Um, in Washington's case, what was his real religion? Was he really religious? Well, that's that's a really that is the question. That is a really good question. You just saw the movie. I mean, it's <laughs> very it's very clear. It's in living my. color, right? <laughs> um, I can't believe everything in the movie, so I'm getting an expert. <laughs> well, it. so he was Anglican. He, as a young man, was involved in his church. Um, going back to where I started when I was talking about how cautious he was about precedent setting and about using the right words and setting the right tone for the new government. You know, the, the nation, the American nation as a republic was pretty alone amidst monarchies. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what mattered in a republic in the minds of people at the time was the, the tenor and the morality of the people mm -hmm. and the, the leaders who they chose. But Go he, ahead. He did go to church regularly. He did, he did go to church, but I, I'm sort of leading into the fact that um, he was very concerned about, in addition to going to church, setting an example of morality. And that's in part why he tended to write broad statements that suggested it wasn't just about Christianity. Well, yeah, and in fact, he doesn't use Jesus Christ as a phrase except maybe once. I, I think was going to say, I think it's a reply one to a Presbyterian oh. letter or something like that. So many of the founding yeah. fathers, not many, but a number of them were called deists. Hmm. De like Thomas Jefferson was accused of that, and some others. Accused is maybe not the right word, but yeah. deist means basically you believe in. God got everything started, but not really spending a lot of time figuring out he, what he doesn't intervene. Do. He, right. he okay. set it all up. But Washington was not a deist, right? Washington was not a deist, no. And was Washington a person who um, you would say uh, wanted the title Mr. President? Did he come up with the title Mr. President, is what it's be called? Or, or, or Adams wanted something else, I think. Yes. Um, so that was quite a debate. Um, Adams wanted something along the lines of His Excellency. You know it. You no, know, it's His High Mightiness and the Protector of protector the Liberties of the Liberty. Of right. I mean, yeah. John Adams came up with That's this. what we have to call David when we see him in the green room. <laughs> well, and people were upset at that, yeah. so that was not considered okay. to be the norm, and they responded by calling right. John Adams Mr. your rotundity. Okay, yeah. so <laughs> his rotundity. That's what so David let's calls talk me. About, do, you, do either of you think that before he went to Rhode Island and visited the synagogue, that he ever met anybody who was Jewish? During the Revolution. He did? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there were, there were Jews in the army, there were Jewish generals. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, before that point, Okay, so he was familiar not. with people who were Jewish, and there was Haim Solomon who helped finance the- exactly. uh, Haim Solomon, he specifically War. asked for Haim Solomon at one point. Yeah, I mean, he certainly okay. knew him. So, um, we have two letters here. Uh, Doug, can you explain what, what we, yeah. these documents are? Uh, these are extraordinary letters, thanks to Seth Caller, who made them available to us. Uh, they're currently down at the uh, Jewish Museum in Philadelphia. One of, so the one on your right, David, is the letter from Moises Sexatius, who was the, he wasn't the rabbi, but he was a congregant of the, of the uh, Turo Synagogue, who welcomed the president to the president of the United States when George Washington visited Newport in uh, August of 1790. And in that letter, he asks, 
that Washington, because remember, New, Rhode Island was late to the Constitution. They didn't ratify it originally. And when George Washington was president, he made it a point to visit every state. But when he visited New England in the not, first year, not Rhode Island. he skipped Rhode <laughs> Island because he wasn't the president of Rhode Island because they hadn't ratified the Constitution yet. So Rhode Island finally comes in. So he goes there in 1790. And they, and, and they greet, the, the Turo Synagogue greets Washington like all the other churches in Newport did and the Chamber of Commerce. and Freemasons. You know, exactly. And, and so it's a letter basically saying, congratulations on being president. We think you're the greatest. We want you to remember that we've been tolerated in the practice of our religion in this, in this in Rhode Island for a long time, and we hope under this new government that that will continue. Which, which was, you know, yeah. again, given that the government was experimental. It's a new thing. And, and know. people were trying to figure out what a republic is, it's how it was going to pre-First Amendment, right? Nobody knows. But this is one of many ways in yeah. which people were trying to figure out exactly. how things work. Now, I do want to say before you go on, it's worth yeah. noting, people might not realize, that's the actual letter. Yes, that's the actual letter. It's not letter. a replica. That is the actual letter. Yeah. So okay. we're in, in the midst of right, history. That's the actual letter. So that is now this what? is the copy that's been magnified, but this is George Washington's response to that letter. And in these responses, and, and remember, Washington is getting all these petitions and letters from all these different groups. You're going to kind of, you're going to, you're going to reflect back what the people said when they, you know, that's sort of the the form. Right. So you say, yeah, I agree with you that this is a country. And the famous line, you know, the United States gives a bigotry no sanction to persecution no assistance, is actually agreeing with what's in the Satius letter, but where Washington goes further is he says it's no longer that toleration is spoken of as if it's in one person's control, you know, to, to tolerate. Rather, we believe that all men have the freedom of conscience. And that, that's the draw on natural rights and the idea of a powerful idea of individual freedom, which is really an aspirational right. value. And the interesting thing, David, there is, you know, Washington says this, and it's an example of an early sort of bully pulpit, because that letter of Washington's then gets published in newspapers, right. and it's all over, the, all over the America, but then ultimately, ultimately all over the world. But what's interesting there is, you know, it, it's like, you know, Americans' values are aspirational values. It's not even true, right? If you live in Massachusetts, you still have to pay to support the minister in your local town. I mean, that doesn't change until the 1830s, these establishments. That, that is so, a copy. Yeah. Where is the original? Well, so the original is uh, in, in, in Philadelphia, owned by uh, Seth could help us, but I think it's the Morgan Stern <laughs> Foundation is the name of the owner. OK, and um, all right, is that so, right? Yeah. Morgan Stern Foundation? Yeah. Thank you, Seth. Yeah. yeah, so it's it's original is there is in Philadelphia now at the yeah. at the Museum of American uh, Jewish History. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, how do we know that's actually Washington wrote that? I mean, could, um, yeah. oh, did he have anybody writing. write letters for him, or that's his handwriting? Well, he traveled the clerks, and this would have been an official response. So it probably would have been copied out by somebody. Uh, I mean, there is some controversy over who actually wrote it. Uh, I think it's all Washington myself. But uh, he also has very distinctive handwriting. He does, he right? Does. So that Beautiful if you're looking, at, it is, but it's yeah. it's quirky. So if you're reading it's, a Washington, it's certainly writing. his signature. Yes. Now, you're one of your favorite presidents, uh, David. I know uh, Kennedy, of course, didn't write any of his speeches. Uh, you know. And, and well, yeah, he gets all the say, same. But these. in those days, people had speechwriters. Yeah, and, and Washington uh, had speechwriters. He had Alexander Hamilton writing some things. Exactly. But sometimes yeah. when Washington would want to send a message to Congress, he would have a member of Congress, James Madison, write it for him. That's right. And then Madison would write the response from Congress back to Washington. And then he would write the response from Washington back to the Congress. Yeah. Yeah. So exactly. Madison write all of them. OK. Yeah, Madison was having a conversation with, with himself. himself. Yeah, yes. So, so by the way, while I have a professor here, I always wonder yeah. when I was an undergraduate, um, I always wanted to know, is this going to be on the exam? And um, do you ever get that question from students? Oh, yeah. Really? They still... They do. But, but, but what's interesting is they, when I teach, I don't tend to focus on dates because I want people, I want the students to understand that these are people making choices. So the version of it that I get is, but wait, there are no dates. What am I memorizing? And will it be on the exam? So. But do students care about, I mean, everybody, you hear about STEM and everything, everybody wants to get a job because they need to have a science or technology background. 
Do students really care about history that much? Mm. You get more students coming into history because history majoring is going down, right? It is, but it's held pretty solid at Yale. Um, so there's a long tradition of, of the history department being one of the strongest in the school. But students care a lot about history. And I actually think in the last few years with an urgency mm. that they didn't necessarily before. So I'm teaching, you know, I've been at Yale for 25 years, remarkably. Um, and I've taught some of the same courses throughout that time. And in, it's in the last few years that students want to talk about things like protest and dissent and how does that work sure. and are you allowed to do that and, and rights and a variety of other things. Uh, you're an expert as well on Hamilton, right? And the play Hamilton, have you seen that? I haven't <laughs> yet. Yeah. Is it uh, reasonably She was involved accurate? in it. She helped Lin-Manuel Miranda produce he, the he thing. He used my, my work for the play. Okay, so it's reasonably accurate. Uh, well, there are many Very things accurate. in it that are remarkably accurate, okay. and then there are some things for dramatic okay. license. Well, do you think, I mean, George Washington is sitting up in heaven saying, wait a second, Hamilton worked for me, he has a big play, it's a big success, how come there's no, no play about me? But you he's think the Washington... hero of that play, David, he's the hero of that well, play. Well, he is Hamilton the hero, is and I don't think he would have loved a big he's not play upset. about himself, and I don't think yeah. Hamilton would have loved a big play about himself. I mean, he was, you know, illegitimate with this humble origin, the fact that they're on Broadway singing about it, I don't know if he would have loved that either. Mm. He, he, I think like many people in the period, mm. he judged the virtue and and rightness of what he did based on it not being popular. Right. Mm. Um, mm. Recently, George Washington celebrated his birthday. What was the birthday? 290. Okay, 290, 290 years, years old. old. Yeah. And at that celebration, I interviewed uh, Andrew Roberts, who wrote a book yes. on King George. Yes, great historian Andrew right. Roberts, recent Churchill book, now this George Do you think uh, King George was uh, portrayed accurately in the Hamilton? <laughs> Uh, show? Do I? Well, m maybe not. Maybe not. Okay. <laughs> well, that's what Andrew's writing his whole book against the Hamilton Okay. You know, uh, so play. Um, you've been studying George Washington for a lot of time mm. now. Um, what about George Washington that you learned in recent years most surprised you yeah. about him? Well, you know, I, when I had the great honor to come to Mount Vernon, I came when we opened the presidential library for George Washington. And, and part of that story is understanding his own library. You know, because he's, he doesn't have a college education, because his father dies, he's got reading, writing, and arithmetic. But he has a great library, and he amasses this over a lifetime of activity. He's a very active guy, but yet he's always purchasing right. books. And, and so for me, David, learning about how he uh, was a lifelong curious acquirer of books, an advocate for reading, uh, an autodidact like Ben Franklin, I mean, and... and you know, and Abraham Lincoln, our greatest presidents, didn't go to college in this country. So maybe that, I don't know what Yale thinks about that, but that's, uh, that I'll might be an issue. Mute. But, uh, but that, that sort of, his, okay. his incredible education, self-driven, uh, for me was really eye-opening. Uh, so yeah. you recently bought, and uh, I should say Mount Vernon recently bought, or not too recently, a couple years ago, yeah. George Washington's copy of the Constitution. Yes, right? yeah. Uh, for a modest, Yes. $10 million. Very large. $9.8 million, okay. which was at the time the most expensive Americana Can I talk book. talk about that, though? Because sure. it's, a, it's a remarkable, remarkable document. Okay. And what's yeah. remarkable yeah. about it is that it's very clear, and this gets back to my earlier point about him being so careful about yeah. precedent. He's reading through the Constitution, and anytime right. there's something yeah. about the presidency, yeah. he writes in the margin, president. Yeah, really. He's figuring out the job on the paper, yeah. which is remarkable. Right. And he does that after he's been president for 10 months. So he goes back to it when the Congress is coming back for their next session. So they had the one session of Congress, they passed all the laws that created the country. They turned what was the Constitution, a piece of paper into a real government, created the executive branch, judiciary branch, passed all the resolutions, which we now know as the 10 amendments to the Constitution, passed right. the first tax laws. And when they're coming back, he's about to get Madison to work on this first State of the Union address, and he's rereading the Constitution. Well, and it's, it's you know, I yeah. mean, it's remarkably short for what it does, right? Yeah. I, I teach it this way. It's a framework of a government with the assumption yeah. that it will be filled in as it's going. So yeah. it's the instruction book. Yeah. And Washington is reading through the instruction book and, and noting, okay, that's part of my job. I mean, well, it, it gets you, you into that it's moment so and the exciting. contingency. Well, and you mentioned, yeah, exactly, and you mentioned earlier, I mean, the, when, he's work, when he's doing that, it's the same 
time he's writing that letter to Catherine McCauley right. Graham, so, mm -hmm. in which he says, I walk on untrodden ground. I walk on untrodden Everything ground. I do is subject to two interpretations. Everything but what's interesting is about setting that a is precedent. There are so many letters in which, in one way or another, people say, I, I walk on thin ice. Yeah. I, you know, so yeah. many people use that metaphor yeah. of the ground breaking beneath them because no one knew if what they were doing would actually work. Mm. So uh, before we take some questions we have from people who are here, um, just f to finish his life, how did George Washington die? And if he was so smart, why did he die that way? <laughs> wow, I, we can ask that of all of us, I guess, after we pass. If he were so smart, why did you die? I mean, well, that hey, way. That's, that's tough. He died of uh, an infection of the epiglottis, epiglottitis uh, of his throat. And uh, he had gone out riding. Every morning, he would get up, do his papers, and then he would get on a horse, go around his estate. And it was, a, it was December, it was sleet, it was rain. He got back to the house and as usual he had guests there and they would have the main meal at three o'clock. He didn't go change his clothes, he sat down wet and then that evening had a fever, an infection and it got worse and worse. Eventually he had the doctors come out and they bled him and he said, take more, bleed me more. He's a big believer in bleeding and, uh, and ultimately uh, he, he couldn't breathe anymore. They thought about doing a tracheotomy, but it was a brand new thing and nobody wanted to do it because it's George Washington. They didn't know if it would work. And then he died. In his will, he said, don't bury me for two days. Why was that? Well, he, he said that because he didn't want to be buried alive, and, uh, which could happen. That, that in a, happened in, exactly, occasionally, right? In a pre-modern, I mean, you could, you know, you could they be in a little coma. Bells, and, I thought they put bells in the coffins to ring in case you were still they alive. They did, the right? dead, dead ringers. So that's, that's what, what that they call dead yeah, ringers. Yeah, right. okay. the, the bell and you wake up and you I'm ring the bell. learning things tonight out there. They let you out. <laughs> but no, he, had, he wanted his body to be laid out for three days before he was buried. And, uh, and that, well, and he was entombed at Where Mount is Vernon. he buried now? Well, he's at Mount Vernon, at George Washington's Mount Vernon. He was in a, what we call the old tomb, which is on the riverbank. In his will, he had asked for a, a new tomb to be constructed uh, okay. by his executors, but it, it took them 20 years to do it because the Congress actually asked Martha Washington if he could be buried in the Capitol. So if you've ever been to the U.S. Capitol and you, that beautiful Apiothis of Washington in the dome where he's floating up to heaven, on point with our conversation this evening. Uh, directly beneath that is a crypt that was built for George Washington's body and okay. Martha Washington. Lurking. But they never, the Congress never got their act together to bring him out there. And then the British burned the Capitol and okay. that took some time. And so he's still at Mount Vernon. Today. Now we have some Come questions. See um, this is the kind of, uh, I guess, a smart person who has the question and also the answer. So. <laughs> Who made George Washington's first pair of bifocals? I know the answer if you do not. It's important. Okay. Anybody know? I defer to the esteemed I, I, professor. I, I, I do I not know. Very nice, Doug. I, I do not know. know. It wasn't Dr. Okay, Greenwood. what's the answer? The answer is David Rittenhouse. Oh, of course, okay. yes. The great mathematician. Okay, all right. That makes there you sense. Go. David Rittenhouse. Okay, person got a question. Thank you very much. All right. Talk about the well Jewish done. community at the time in the United States. Was there much of a Jewish community? And the film said that the first Jews came to New York. I actually thought they went, were in South Carolina. But. Well, there were five major centers okay. for a while of Judaism. Um, yeah. Savannah, Charleston, Philadelphia, and New York, and then Newport, Rhode Island. Um, the film actually does a good job of saying there were roughly 3,000 Jews and there were roughly 3 million people. So that gives you a sense of the very few numbers of people yeah. who were here. So the um, Jewish population was 3,000 out of 3 million. So that's one-tenth of one percent. Yeah. Now it's a little bit bigger, but not a little, little bit. Yeah, it was a tiny so, minority okay. at the time. But the Jews who came were from the Sephardic Jewish community? Mostly Sephardic, okay. yeah. And uh, here's the a, earliest settlements came actually were exiles from what had been Dutch okay. Brazil and ended up in New Netherlands in the 17th century. Um, here's a question. Do we have any information about the Jewish community in the southern states? How do they live? They live well? Were they discriminated against or? I mean, there was anti-Semitism everywhere. It is striking, if you think about it, that Charleston and Savannah yeah. um, are two of the larger Jewish congregations. It's not what you would expect, I think, given your image or the general popular image of the South. I don't know if, they were, if there was more anti-Semitism there than okay. anywhere else. All right. Uh, I mean, the, the Secretary of the Treasury of the Confederacy was Jewish uh, in South Carolina, and he famously said when he was attacked for being Jewish that my ancestors were civilized while yours were still painting yourself blue. Okay. 
So here's one for Dr. Bradburn. As a history student, I was wondering um, how Mount Vernon is working on modernizing its education programs while still keeping true to its origins. I'm sorry, could you repeat that again, yeah. David? How is, uh, how is Mount Vernon, let's just say, how is yeah. modernizing its education programs? You have education programs? Yeah, well, I mean, you you know, them? we are always, one of the great things that the Ladies Association has done at Mount Vernon in the last 25 years is really invest in research there. And so uh, when people come to Mount Vernon, we're always using new research to help understand and tell the stories of George Washington, of the estate, of the enslaved at Mount Vernon, uh, and of course of his impact and his legacy. And, and the movie tonight is an example of of a lot of outreach and, and materials we create that, that attempt to speak to the current generation. You can't just teach stories in the same way. And as Joanne will, will tell you, a lot of people think history sort of happened and it's sort of there and why do you have to rewrite it all the time? The reality is the, the way we tell history is about the present. People want to know about why things are the way they are and where we're going as a people. And so there's new questions that you're always right. posing to the past. And that's, that's an energy, I think, that makes these places always living, always dynamic, and, uh, and, and we're very much a part of that. Okay. Were there examples of religious conflict within the Continental Army? If so, did that affect the troops' readiness? I don't know if there was conflict. They did take care to have uh, um, religious figures in the Army, the, yeah. you know, uh, uh, it was tricky. I mean, right, you know, because it, right, I mean, there was everybody hated the Catholics if you were New Englanders, and you, they'd been the big enemies, and then all of a sudden the French are there. Right, but so, so how but are you going to navigate that? They were know? tending to. They had religious figures there to serve the army, and adding to that, there were not all Quakers stayed yeah. out. So there were even, there's a very, Nathaniel Green, well-known general. Yeah. Very bad Quaker, too. by the way, but great well, general. He was fighting. Yeah. But, but so anyway, the, the short answer is, yeah, that they were actually tending to the religious beliefs okay. of the continental. So I the, mean, it was, it really was a great, uh, a trick on the one hand, you have this, you have chaplains, but you got them from all these different faiths. And, you know, George Washington on the St. Patrick's Day, he celebrates St. Patrick and some other holiday he'll celebrate. So he was constantly trying to downplay the differences of the okay. different troops. Now, uh, sometimes religion. we think that members of Congress today don't get along with each other. They, maybe yeah. they argue a lot. But you wrote a book about how <laughs> uh, in the Civil War, they actually would hit each other a lot on the floor. In fact, they would beat them up each other so much that they were unable to come back to the Senate for a year Years. or two. What was the worst example of that that happened? Oh, wow. Well, well so the, the, the two-sentence background is um, I wrote a book called The Field of Blood, uh, and I found 70, 70 examples of physically violent incidents in the House and in the Senate between 1830 and 1860. So that's people pulling knives, people pulling guns, uh, pushing. Guns on the other. floor of the Congress? I can't believe that. They, really? <laughs> Shocking, I know. Hard to believe that. Um, okay. Yes, indeed. Um, so, so it's actual physical confrontation. To me, the most, well, the most extreme one in some ways is the one that probably a lot of people know, which is the caning of Charles Sumner. But what's striking is that obviously that's not the only violent incident. It's representative of many more. To me, the most interesting and kind of looming one takes place in 1858. So we're very close to the war at that point. And there's um, a anti-slavery congressman standing amidst some Southerners speaking. And there's a South Carolina congressman who had apparently had a lot to drink with dinner and who yelled at this anti-slavery fellow, get over with your own people. You shouldn't be over with our people. And this anti-slavery congressman said, I don't have to listen to some whip driving slaveholder. I don't, I, who, I, this is my house too. In the end, what happens is this Southerner strides up to the guy who he tried to call back to his seat, and this anti-slavery congressman punches him and flattens him, the Southerner. At this, all of these Southerners rush up to the space in front of the speaker's chair in the House. Seeing that, all of these anti-slavery Republicans jump over desks and chairs to get to the fight. You end up with dozens of congressmen punching, scraping, pulling at each other in the space in front of the speaker's chair. And what's striking about it is it goes on for a few minutes, it stops. And usually right. what normally happens is what happens here, which is everyone goes back to their seat so nobody... and they go back to work. No one is seriously hurt. But the reporters, mm. if you think about these are armed northerners and southerners running at each other in the house, the reporters said, that looks like a battle. 
But not, nobody went to jail for that. Nope, no, nobody ever went to jail for, okay. for these fights. But that was that was a, a kind of a battlefield. But the worst case was uh, was it uh, Charles Sumner? Charles Sumner. Sumner. He was beaten by uh, another member of the Senate uh, or another uh, the House. A, a representative of, of came over, South Carolina. hit him on the head, and and, and Sumner was. Had to stay out of the Senate for a couple of years. Well, he, yeah, I mean, he. So he was insulted by something that Sumner had and, but said. But did he ever? Week. Did anybody get punished for that? Uh, Preston Brooks, I think, is charged a little bit of okay. money, but he sent reward canes. Mm. So, so you know. well, you're almost out of time, uh, Doug. Who is the person that day to day um, is the in charge of Mount Vernon? Other than you, you have the regents, and there's a there's a vice regent from yeah. many of the states but they elect a regent, is that right? Yeah, so we're, we're 501c3. Our board is the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. There's one board member per state, but not from every state. All the board, they're all, all the board members are, are women. They're called vice regents. And then the regent is elected by that group, and she's the chairman of the board, and uh, she's with us today in the Where audience. Is the uh, regent here? Mag Nichols from here's, the state of Maine. Right here she is. <laughs> and she's here for us. <laughs> The 23rd region to the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. How many have there been? Yeah, and How many regions have there been? Uh, well, 23rd. She's the 23rd. I'm the 11th resident director of Mount Vernon. And that job comes with a gigantic salary and everything? Yeah, yeah. Or? It's, look at me. I'm dressed well, exactly. I mean, they're being regents. They, they're, it's a oh, the region? No, they serve. Region. They're volunteers. It's they're all volunteers, volunteer right? Board. They give their time, their passion, their energy, their all to uh, the preservation of this incredible place this in trust for the american people it's an iconic uh part of american identity right. and why is it called mount vernon why not called mount washington or something why is it called mount yes vernon? wonderful question so george washington inherited it from the heirs of his uh, half-brother lawrence washington who served with a man named edward vernon a, an english admiral who uh, lost the Battle of Cartagena in the War of Jenkins' Ear. And, uh, but, but Lawrence served with him, spent actually a lot of time on shipboard with him, and, and thought he was right. a great man. And so he named the place Mount Vernon after so, Edward Vernon. It's now, the only house in America named after an English admiral. Now, final question. I, I assume George Washington did not have a, uh, a Jewish mother, but he had a mother, right? <laughs> yeah, yes, and, he did. Um, was his mother proud of him and told him how, what a great job he was doing all the time as being, you know, winning the war and first president? What did she think of him? I'm going to leave that one to yeah, you, Yeah, the, the, uh, the relationship between George Washington and his mother was fraught. I mean, there was a famous letter in which he told her not to come and live at Mount Vernon. And she complained that, you know, he, he might have been a big guy, but he needed to do a better job taking care of her. And uh, so, uh, yeah, they, she was tough. I think that he got a lot of his strength and grit from her. She actually was, um, there are stories of her teaching him how to read the Bible in her lap. And, and so I those are family stories. I do want to intervene, stories. though, yeah, because please. it is worth noting that, that the stories of the tense relationships yeah. between them, and there are some, are from um, biographies largely written by men. Yeah, Samuel Morrison and others. Yeah. So there are, there's a long history of these biographies not quite wrestling well, I can, with the I'll, women yeah. in the lives of some of these men. I agree. So well, I just put that out there. Well, no, I will. And I'll, here's what I will say. I'll take it even further, Joanne. Okay. Okay. I will up the ante there okay. because she, uh, Mary Washington in the 19th century was the first female hero of the United States. The first national monument built to a woman was built in Mary Washington in Fredericksburg. Andrew Jackson was there oh. when this thing was put up. But then in the 20th century, after Sigmund Freud decided that any man who had a strong mother was gonna be a sissy, which is the word they used, all these historians in the early 20th century start like saying, well, Lawrence was more important to George Washington than his mother, and she starts getting blaggarded. But there's a couple of new books out, I think, which put her back in their place. Well, she, George she Washington, some more study, exactly. Right? Rather than people using her to George their Washington, own point. Uh, was, yeah, exactly. was called the father of our country, but did he actually father any children that we know of? No, he did not. Why well, not? and that was important. Why did he not? Well, I mean, we believe that he was sterile because he had smallpox, as some historians and doctors have argued. But it was but, vitally important because it meant that he couldn't give the presidency right. to his son. Yeah. So it was one of many reasons why he, it seemed safe to give him power. Yeah. So the greatest president uh, of our country, in your view, was, you have to say, George Washington. I, I do, yes. I'm <laughs> contractually yeah. And you obligated. would say? I would never answer that question. I wouldn't answer that I would, question. Because, because there's... 
There's too much you can say pro and con. There are some really, really bad presidents. Really? This is the state of teaching at Yale um, these days. Oh, her rump, her rump, her rump. <laughs> um, but the best, you, you have to ask some questions. Yeah. Okay, so final question for each of you. Mm. Um, you now admire George Washington more than you did before, I, yes or no? Yeah, I did. I absolutely. Before I, when I was a professor, I hadn't actually studied George Washington as closely as I have in the last 10 years now. And uh, I definitely admire him more as a, both a historical figure okay. and a man. All right. What, what do you most admire about George, George Washington? Well, I'm a political historian. And, and when I was working on my first book, what impressed me was um, him doing things like to prove that he wasn't a king because the king is the default. He would do things like at two or three o'clock in the afternoon, he would take a walk around the block and take out his watch and set it by the, the church and go back into his office. He was doing that explicitly to show that he, wa he could walk in the streets like anyone. Mm. He didn't have to be carted around in a carriage. And he got fan mail okay. mm. for wow. the walks because people understood what they meant. So if somebody wants to contribute to Mount Vernon, uh, is there any way they can do so or you don't take donations? No, we, we very much take donations. I think there'll be somebody at the door, but uh, <laughs> uh, mountvernon.org is where, but I would also, I mean, I just encourage you to really look at our educational materials and tell people and tell teachers you know about the resources that are there. They're all for free, they're all available, and, uh, and they're all sourced, uh, okay. which is critical. Thank you very much, both of you, you, for Dave. a very interesting conversation. Thank you for the film, and uh, thank you all for coming. And these documents will be on display as you exit the theater. All right? Yes. Thank, thank you, you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Okay. That was lovely. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you.